Chapter 11 of The Phantom of the Opera, entitled Above the Trap Doors. It's the next day at the opera, and Raoul sees the ring that Christine is wearing. It's a ring that he noticed from the day before at Madame Valerius's house, which is where Christine stays. It's a ring that has apparently been a gift from the opera ghost, and she wears it to keep him at bay. We find that Raoul is set to take an expedition in the polar north. He's about to leave in a month, and Christine suggests that they play a game at being engaged until he leaves. The problem is, is that he takes it too seriously and he decides not to go. And this causes a bit of concern for Christine. Later, when Carlotta relinquishes her position at the opera, Christine is invited to take her place. The establishment is completely happy with this decision and she is welcomed with praise and yet she continues to vanish much to Raoul's dismay. Raoul is jealous and he seeks to confront Eric about this situation, he's just had enough. He thinks that Christine and him should be together and he's just not having any of this third party material. However, in light of this idea, Christine distracts him by taking Raoul on tours of the opera house all through, up and down, everywhere, except the cellars. Christine knows what that means and she is not going to take him down there. At this point they start talking about him. Ultimately, Raoul wants an explanation as to who the opera ghost really is. Chapter 12 of The Phantom of the Opera, entitled Apollo's liar. To avoid the cellars, Christine takes Raoul to the rooftops. Here they sit in front of the Greco-Roman god Apollo and they proceed to have a long conversation. Christine admits her fear of Eric and Raoul suggests that they leave at once. She's got one more performance and he's like, let's just go now forget about Eric. However, she does continue to explain the situation. She states that the voice had adopted her suggestion that the angel of music was in fact Eric or vice versa. Eric notices that she thinks that she's being visited by the angel of music and Eric is like, yeah, I'll play into that. I'm I'm your angel. At this point, Christine is confused by what this draws up in her mind. She has ideas about the angel of music being real. This draws a connection to her father, and she also has feelings for Raoul, and she's experiencing affinity for the voice itself. So there's all this confusion going on, but she is starting to put two and two together, and she's sifting things out in her mind. She does admit that she was beguiled. She was on to the notion that there's something to be explained here that could potentially be non-supernatural. However, as she realizes this, she also senses that there's danger involved with unraveling the mystery. She starts to describe a moment by the mirror where the opera ghost appears to her singing in his heavenly voice. She vanishes from the room and wakes up in the cellars of the opera house. She encounters the horse that was stolen and she's placed on this horse and she's traveling around the cellars in, in the subterranean world. She's never seen it before. She claimed that she had been nearly close to going into the cellars, but then she decided not to go any further because it was just too freaky. She encounters the lake, and she also encounters a man who was in a mask. This man has been living in the cellars, and as he is masked, 
and in front of her, he states that his name is merely Eric. This means that there is no angel of music or a magic voice. It's all just some guy in a mask. Christine is mortified by this news, but she admits that she doesn't hate him now that she knows. She's got a curious sort of affinity that's been welling up in her the entire time. In this process of meeting each other, Eric justifies his behavior as being centered in his love for Christine. He's blaming all his criminal activity on love. Though he offers her an exit at that moment, she decides to stay, and it's at that point that she becomes his prisoner for two entire weeks. In time, they come to practice songs and melodies on the piano, and it's during a performance of Othello. She has an urge to remove the mask, and she can't resist it. And as they're playing piano and singing together, she goes ahead and follows through with that irresistible urge to remove the mask from his face because she wants to know who he is. And oh, the horror. This is the moment that she has been waiting for to know who is behind the mask. It horrifies her. She is completely dismayed by what she sees. And he, in turn, at being unmasked, is angry, but he's also kind of gluttonous about it. He is so ugly that he takes a curious, perverted type of joy in completely mortifying her and he is just taking it all in in a sort of cathartic way as though some part of him has been wanting to unveil himself. After all the drama, he releases her after she promises that she will come back to visit him. However, her subsequent visits cause Eric's obsession to go on the increase and he just becomes more unstable. As Christine has been telling Raul all of this at the statue of Apollo, it turns out that the opera ghost has been listening to the entire conversation. What we have in these chapters mostly in chapter 12, is the craft of using dialogue to explain elements of the story. So we have Raul and Christine are in a sort of enclosed spot, even though it's on top of a roof. It's open air. It's, it's just the two of them. It's a private space. And it's here that they're able to exchange dialogue that in turn functions in the narrative as a way of explaining details of the story. This is one that I noticed as a close reader myself. In the story of Dracula, there's a moment where Van Helsing is talking about a figure called King Laugh. And what it is, it's reference to the act of laughing while you're crying. And I just thought it was strange that Christine actually mentions this action. And I've never encountered it in another story other than Dracula. Obsession is highly prevalent here. All of his insane behavior and all of it is due to his love of Christine. And lastly, we have a thorough description of who this person, Eric, really is. Eric is a gruesome escort. He accuses himself, he curses himself, he implores Christine's forgiveness. He confesses his cheat. He loves her. He lays at her feet an immense and tragic love. 
He has carried her off for love. He has imprisoned her with him, underground, for love. But he respects her. He crawls, he moans, he weeps. He is not an angel, nor a ghost, nor a genius. He is cold, and at the same time bony. Christine remembers that his hands smell of death. He wags the hideous thing that is his head on his shoulders, his terrible dead flesh. He is built up of death from head to foot, a corpse. He sleeps in an open coffin. His face reveals extreme anger, the mighty fury of a demon. You cannot see his blazing eyes except in the dark. This is the thing. The man. Eric. Who loves Christine more than any man could ever know.